With pass-ups, the need for cleaning can sneak up on you. I'm an example. I, about 15 months ago, did a thorough hand cleaning of both of my pass-up locks, but it had become extremely difficult to operate. Didn't fail in any regard, but it took all my strength. I'd be huffing and puffing at the end of every row. So Jack declared it was time for a deep clean and has done one. And after the Marvel Mystery Oil Soak, which is covered in other videos, this is the crud he was able to get out by hand to my great embarrassment. But that's how it is. It'll hide inside the convolutions of a passive block. We've recently heard from several people trying to restore passives who have kind of advanced questions and do have the mechanical and engineering skills to address them. So this video is for you people who are beyond the basic DIY level and can take advantage of advanced information. Part of the Marble Mystery Soak is that all of that fiber sediment that was in here floated out and it settled on these flat surfaces so that I had to hand polish and scrape. And you can see there's a little bit of discoloration still on that one that will come right off but many of these I had to scrape with my little screwdriver you can see some of the discoloration still on it mm -hmm. so that's what the soak does is all those fibers that you cannot see become soaked in oil and settle to the bottom and they'll collect all along and these bottom surfaces I think it logically follows tell me if I'm right that's why you can't just soak it and drain it and go back to work because they're still there. Right. And they're the, loose. You can get them out now. And if it's been a year, this has been in a little over four weeks. And you see how easy it is to get this amount of felting out. And that's exactly what it is. It's felted itself in the mystery oil. Then the silicon spray, my favorite food grade silicon will wash all that stuff out where you can get to it and make a nice but pile. I should say you've been working on this all morning. This is not a five minute thing. No, I would say I probably have an hour and a half in this lock, of course, running through all the tests to make sure that everything works. All right, you can notice this poor cover has been around a long time. There should be an N here, N and X, is two positions for the lever. And you'll notice, A, you can see a little, the B looks like a D, C is okay, and then the D, E, they're really faded. Well, we're looking at it upside down as well at the moment. But now, if we were in position and the cover was on, you can see we're in the A position. And we will operate the NX lever... So you can see what's going on inside the carriage to know what to look for if yours is sticking in any one position. We've had several people contact us recently who've done what seemed to them a really thorough job of cleaning, and they're still having trouble. And although breakage of a part is conceivable, it's not very common. So we're going to help you look for where it could still be sticking even after a cleaning. Right, and you'll notice there's a little glistening sheen on this. And what that is, is a little bit of condensation because the LPS silicon, when it comes out and you just use it like I do very freely, it chills the metal. So it's got a... So it's picked up some condensation from the Just room. a little bit, but now there's AX, and you'll notice that's easy peasy. Look at these two spots right here. I'll try to tip it. They both go down. All right, so you would look on the underside. If the camera will hold on, I'll flip it. And you'll see that's these two. Whoops, I wasn't there. Try okay. again. These two levers here, I'm going to operate it. See them? And here's something else to look for. That one and that one go down in the X position and back up in the in position. So this is what you're looking for. What is moving when you go into X in the A position? And it should be easy peasy. 
right now I have no cover on this flipper. So I'm just bare fingering it. So what can happen is if it gets crud into the works that you can't actually see and it looks shiny and clean on the outside, it makes them so stiff that even if they're not broken, sometimes they either don't respond at all or not with the pep that they ought right. to. And notice this, your first slide moves. Everybody else is stationary. And this is the only slide that moves in the AX position. Now, this is very important. Just like on your punch card machines, these plates are so close together. They only have room for a little bit of silicon between them. They don't really have very much room for any amount of fiber buildup. So that's AX. Here's B. And B is one of the hardest ones. We'll go underneath and I'll show There's you. There's a lot happening in yeah. the B position. Right. But that is easy peasy right there. If I had the handle on this lever, which gives you quite a bit of advantage. That'd It'd be, be a perfect. fingertip yeah. operation. Let's go to the bottom and look at what we get. I'll do it again. Watch these two come down. But look, this whole plate raises up on both sides. You can see that now. So you have quite a bit of action going on in BX. But again, your silicon spray, I don't know if the camera can see, there's a set of springs right here. These are spring-loaded plates. There's a good shot if the camera can get it. There's the spring right above the screwdriver tip. But that needs to be well, well lubricated for that to be a smooth operation. All right, that was BX. Let's go to CX. Again, easy peasy. And if you'll notice... A reminder to knitters, CX is the tubular or circular knitting position, which means that... One lock knits going one way, and the other knits going the other way. But what I want to point out is the first slide is A, the second slide is B, now we're in C, and the third one is the one that moves. Now when we go to D, there's your relationship right there. A, B, C, D. So you engineers who've been trying to help knitters with this, that's some information you need. Right. In what setting are you having trouble? And that will tell you where you're looking for the trouble inside and, the lock. Right. Now, notice in this position, this goes down, which means we have a drop in a plate on the bottom. But on one side, not on the other side. Because this is a definitely a one-sided movement. It's intended to slip, meaning no knitting, no action of any kind going one direction. Right. Now we're going to turn the dial again and we'll be in EX. And notice that's another one. If anything's sticking, this shouldn't be it. It's moving that next slide in the second package. I'm calling like the guitar. Here's the first package. <laughs> and this is the second package. These are my bass strings up here. And EX is Fisherman's Rib. Right. which means the bed will knit every needle going one direction, but tuck every needle going the other. Tucking means it grabs a loop of yarn, but it just holds onto it until future notice. Let's go to the bottom and see what that's doing on the bottom. Okay, see, that's such a minor movement right here. And that's why it's so easy to achieve with your levers yeah, on the top. This side, but not that side. And that's all it's moving is that one little lever. But you'll notice... Again, it's telling the lock to slip going one direction. Right. But you'll notice in BX, it moved this whole package. Okay. On both sides. And this is the spring load I was telling you about. You can see how it works. Okay. What if you push on that manually and you do not get the action you're getting? Is that symptomatic of dirt or something missing or broken, or could it be either one? All right, notice you have a lock nut here. Under that is a spring. That's part of the spring load for the whole package. 
Now notice when I do that one by itself, it's the same thing. There's a lock nut on a rod with a little tiny spring under it. See how the rod will drop down? If that rod doesn't drop down when I hold that in, then there's too much corrosion under there. And that's what... So besides, a spring could potentially be broken, but it isn't often. Right. But corrosion could prevent it from... Yeah, just too much reacting building. Reacting properly. Now see, upside down, again, the rod drops once the spring pressure is taken off. I'm trying off to of get it. the shadow off of this. Okay, let me see. move my little... Ah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. See, the spring is under this part right here. So when I hold this down, there's nothing to hold that little rod and lock nut up. Now, we normally do not disassemble all of those springs and levers, but there have been occasions when it was necessary. Yes, but notice this red mark right there? Mm-hmm. Okay, that is on both sides. That tells you that this nut, or this screw is torqued to a certain tolerance and they spray painted it red to let you know, don't move it. So it's, if you can possibly get by without. Now, right. if, if you're trying to salvage something that's rusted solid and you are yes. ambitious, you may have to do it. But if there are other options, take them. Is yes, same thing with these two lock nuts. These things are put on to a certain torque and distance setting so that this only comes up to the height of the bottom of this stationary plate on both sides. So if you've got a micrometer and you're good with your torque wrench in inch pounds, you could take this loose and go into it, replace a spring, clean it if it was corroded, but you'd have to get it back. But unfortunately, we don't have access to whatever... Specs manual was given to the professional mechanics back in right. the days when Passip trained them. Um, Jack tried to go to Passip school, and they wouldn't let him because he wasn't a dealer, even though a dealer wanted to send him. They were very exclusive. Yes, right there. And Man they would the not bone. they would not give or sell their materials to anyone else. So you would have to estimate or find out the torque. What right? I would do is I would use a flat standard like the bottom of a screwdriver or a machinist standard and set these two spring loads to be right at the level of this stationary plate when they were completely at the height that they can go to. And you would, if they were too high, you would tighten these. If they're too low, you would loosen these. That's how I would do it. But I don't, it's not a DIY type yeah, thing. Yeah, Jack is speaking to that handful of you who are, in fact, competent mechanical engineers, not to most of us. This is way over my head, and those who watch will know I go into the machines pretty freely, but that, not to that point. And it's not recommended. You really got to know what you're doing and how to set these standards by eye to get it right. Now we're going to F. And again, both of these... Okay, it's the second package of levers and the second lever moving towards right. us. Right. And it's a little... It's, it, it requires some movement. But you can see, you can hear. Everybody's moving just fine. Mm -hmm. I want to point out while we're looking in there that you can spray inside of here with your silicon... Because watch what happens. See that plate is sliding. You can see the plate slide. Okay, so all of this must be very, very clean, and free, and moving. well lubricated. And if you'll notice, there's a couple of pivot points, like right there. Let me get my shadow out of the way. There's a rod with a circlip on it. And that means that rod slides in a slot. You can see the slot right there, and it slides on the back and on the front. So this needs to be really, really clean and well lubricated for that to take place. There, there's the full throw. See, you'll notice this can be in any part of a position along here. But it's not going to function well unless right. it's going all the way to it's, the destination. Yes, that's why I wanted to point out that slot. 
You got a piece of crud in there. What happens? It, it sticks, of course. It only goes so far. And it wouldn't take much. A piece of wire. I did some electrical work. And you can see that little piece of copper wire right there left on my pad. That would be enough in that slide slot to stop it. So if you broke a needle, if you... Oh got gosh, a, a needle latch would do it. Yes. And they fly off when they break. When they break. Any little piece of metal corrosion, and especially on the passive where you've got pushers, pusher locks, needles... Anything can chip something and, okay, there you go. You got to make sure you get full throw. Now, all right, now, gee, ooh, you can see the carriage jump up and down. This is the only time. Lock, you, lock, lock, lock. Lock, lock, lock. This is the only time you're going to see this lever move. Let me see. We didn't see it. GX. It's also the only time you're going to see these two screw heads appear in these cylinders. So GX is your free pass where the lock will go either direction and it will not engage anything. And it's super important that it work right because as a teacher told me once, it's the get me out of here saying. <laughs> right. If you have a jam and GX will not engage or ac more accurately disengage the locks from what's going on, you cannot fix your jam without breaking a bunch of needles and damaging the lock. And you'll notice this is the hardest one there is. BX is pretty tough, but this one requires quite a bit of effort. And you notice there's pinky finger doing it. But let's go to the underside and see why. Look at what it's done. All of these plates, including these stops, are down. See, this stuff you mean moves. It, right. Towards the lid away from the works of the machine? Right, right. I work with them upside down when I right. work with them, so down is away from me. But, but actually, that's up away right. from the mechanics. Yeah, it's raised. But look at these two plates. I call them stationary plates because most of the time they are. But, but you see, they move. Well, this is why right. she gets you out of here. That's it's, right. It's not engaging anymore. Everything is clear from the needle path mm -hmm. all the way from side to side. And I, you, if it's working right, you can get out of the most ghastly spots and at least right. save maybe not your work, but all the needles in the machine right. and start and again. Let's look. See, this goes down. This goes down. These two go down. And there you can get a good shot, if I can hold the light right, of this big heavy-duty coil springs I was talking about. Okay, yeah. So this is what we're saying is all of this is calibrated so that when these slides are activated on the top with that NX lever, all of these springs let this stuff go. But when you're out of that particular setting, they're all spring-loaded into their positions. You see, I can't even push those down. There's no spring load involved in this particular setting. These are mechanical movements that only move one time, and that's in the GX position. Well, in one sense, a passive lock is just like any other carriage. It's taking the yarn across, and it's telling the needles how to behave in response to that yarn. But it is such a complicated mechanical thing as compared to yes. some that it is less tolerant of crud, I would say, than, well, for example, my SK-150. That's a bulky studio singer model. And it's much simpler than this underneath. And of course, it's a bulky. And it's it puts up with a good bit of fuzz before it argues. Think about, think of this as the carriage and the card reader for one of your medium, oh, to, yeah, in medium to fine gauge machines. So it's all in this lock. Right. And notice this is your needle size path. See that right there mm. is what we're going to have to activate. Needs a little more lever cable. You think. <laughs> by hand. To and get that, that, of course, is what the dial that goes from zero to eight. Right. Is the center learning. dial for your stitch size. This is what it's controlling. But watch. That disappears. 
your stitch dial is no longer engaged to anything that may have been around it. So if a needle butt or anywhere in that path, they're going to instantly be disengaged. Do you see what I'm saying is it's gone now. So are you we in GX? Yeah, we're in GX. It's mm -hmm. completely out of the picture as far as what it's doing to a needle And there's one butt. more setting, and it's not a setting I've used very much, so I won't comment much. Uh, but we'll get it's to it. HX. Right. We're in EN. And, and as a matter of fact, pinky knitters... The reason that I don't use HX much is I learned on a pinky and it didn't exist. Right. It's an addition. Here we are in HX. And we've seen this setting before where these are depressed, lifted up. The difference is a scoop comes down on one side and not on the other side. I'll activate it again. You can see scoop down, scoop up. That's the major difference in this one. One thing that has happened to me a lot after deep cleaning is I'll think it's running like gangbusters and I'll be so happy and I'll come back the next day or two and it is, it's become really stiff again. Other than leaving dirt in the machine, which you have to go back in after and we've had to a million times, what's going on there? Okay, the main thing is and we'll go back and use these very close tolerance slides as an example. Okay, we got, say we got 90% of the sedimentation and fiber out of them. Right now, I've sprayed them within an inch of their lives. And they're smooth. They operate very smoothly. But it doesn't take long for that silicon to move around between those slide plates. And okay, say you have a couple of settings you really like. This one, and that one, and then back to this one. That's Those three settings are where you live. That means there's no lubrication moving between those plates on the other settings. So it's not unusual to have to turn this up and spray. And let me show you the areas with the red straw that I say to work on. I told you about these spring loads, but you see the pivot points are here and here and here and here. And you can see there's a slotted area right there. Okay, so it's not unusual to have to go back and spray along the top here, along the section in here and down here where everything pivots to re-lubricate. After you have already cleaned it, it's nice and clean, but the lubrication isn't worked into it until you've worked the care. The so, lock. in other words, after, especially if it sat for a while, and that's why you decided it needed cleaning. Right. So, you've deep cleaned, and you've lubricated, and it's working. It may not have enough lube in every area to persist all those days that you want it to. And you may have to do it several times. Yes, just as we have said in many videos, after it's had Marvel Mystery Oil soak, use some scrap yarn. You're going to see some crud come out. You're going to see some mystery oil. Even come after out. you manually try right. to clean it. As and clean I have as cleaned and cleaned and cleaned. So when those things come out, you got to put lubrication back in. That's what you need to consider if some crud comes out, you need to get lubrication back in. So, so it's, would you say that after a deep clean, maybe every time you go to use it, you should lubricate for a few times? Is that true? I would recommend it just one little squirt with the yeah. with the silicon. Yeah. If you'll notice when you not one other thing, Jack loves the silicon because it doesn't make a mess. It it doesn't get nasty residue on things. It doesn't drip out on the floor. Right. Whereas some people really like ballastol, and actually I really like ballastol, and it's more persistent to some degree than his favorite, but it does drip out. Well, and I will tell you, it's easier to get the silicon into the works. This is a finer any, product. Right, than anything else. By finer, I don't mean better. I mean... The molecule the is molecules smaller. The molecules are smaller, right? Right. Hydrocarbon molecules are bigger than anything else. And the silicon 
one molecule does the job. Now, what I was going to point out is, if you'll notice when the cover is on, now there's normally a plate here, but if you look under, you'll see that you can spray all down in here with the straw. See where I'm putting it? You can spray in here with the straw, even when it's completely assembled, right in there. That was the spot we were talking about underneath. You can spray that very, just one or two squirts before you use it until it's, every time you go to use it, it's nice and smooth and slick. The comparison is how easy is it to use now? When it becomes just a little bit harder than that, stop, go ahead and spray it again. Jack is getting this cover off again. He just put it on to put it on in front of your eyes. All right, you notice I've got this in the center position. Start it there. Turn it up where you can see how it's bulging a little right there. Mm -hmm. Now it's in place. Voila. And you can release those to put the slides on. And you can feel the cover never sits hard, but it is no. snapped into place. You do want to be careful. These are very brittle old plastic. Yes.